Good afternoon, everyone. It's uh, obviously very personally fulfilling to, to stand here. We started in 2012 uh, to try and bridge the gaps between people interested in doing business in Africa. So uh, thank you all for, for continuing to support and uh, Mofe and Sned to continuing the, that legacy. I'd like to introduce uh, Mr. Cyril Odu. Um, Cyril Odu is the Chief Executive Officer of African Capital Alliance, a leading Pan-African private equity firm with over $1 billion in aggregated capital commitments. Previously, Cyril was partner, head of energy at ACA and joined ACA in 2012. Odu is also the chairman of Union Bank Nigeria PLC. He joined the board of directors of Union Bank in 2012 and was appointed chairman of the board in November 2015. Prior to his appointment as CEO of ACA and chairman of Union Bank Nigeria, Cyril had a 40-year distinguished career at ExxonMobil that saw him rise from trainee to vice uh, chairman of the board of, of Mobile Producing Nigeria and chief financial officer of Exxon Upstream Companies in Nigeria, making him the highest ranking Nigerian in the organization until his retirement in 2012. And I'm sure you'll get a, a flavor of what that truly means when he, he steps up to speak. During the span of his career at Exxon Mobil, he served in many technical and managerial functions. He's actively or was actively involved in developing and executing Exxon Mobil business strategies in Nigeria, as well as in the implementation of several innovative funding and financing solutions, including the first upstream financing in Nigerian history. Um, without further ado, let's welcome Cyril Odu to the stage. Thank you very much, Erotimi, for that very elaborate introduction. Anytime uh, people talk about my 40 years in mobile and then I left mobile seven years ago, it was like, did you join as a baby? And I, <laughs> I joined as a graduate, actually as a campus recruit back in uh, 1972. And uh, I, I was trained as a geologist and joined mobile as a geologist, but in the course of my career, I kind of veered from you know, doing investment, uh, planning for the company, helping to develop programs, to being a uh, you know, uh, treasurer of the company, becoming controller, and then at some point did project finance in the UK for the region, uh, Europe, Africa, Middle East. Came back to Nigeria post-merger, became a, a you know, country manager for HR, of all things. But that, that getting in touch with people and how people development is key. And human capital is key to running any business. And, and then retired uh, CFO of the company, like you said. So in the course of my career, I think one of the things that I've found most fulfilling is uh, being able to invest in businesses and also being able to invest in people. And so when I was asked to come and uh, deliver this, I thought it would be a good opportunity to share some of my experiences with you, but also to talk about private equity in, Af in Africa and specifically what ACA has done as a pioneer. So without further ado, let me just uh, kick it off with showing. Uh, so I'm going to cover sort of a broad overview on the macro level of Africa and how alternate asset management fits in and as it's got, we'll continue to grow. Then I'll talk about ACA and some of the lessons we've learned. And I'll talk a little bit about the future and where we're headed. Uh, so let's talk about the macro for a little bit and how AUMs have grown in Africa. So it's been a 30 year history. I mean, the, uh, so the first set of funds that were Africa focused started back 30 years ago. ACA started 20 years ago. And mostly at that time, they were seeded by DFI significantly. Uh, but as time went and, you know, they grew. And so by 2000, you had like a billion dollars under management in uh, private equity across Africa. But to see just how it has accelerated, here we are today with over 30 billion under management across Africa. So it's, it's been a significant growth. Stepping back a little bit to see what's driving that growth. I mean, everybody sees Africa as maybe the dark continent, but you know, 
And I know when everybody heard about Africa rising some years back, and it looks like it has you know, stifled a little bit. But the truth is that a lot of factors, a lot of headwinds still driving AUM growth in Africa. And let, let me talk a little bit about some of them. And it's very important to see what's, what's, what's leading to some of what we're seeing. You know, if you think about how governments are evolving, you know, people, there's more transparency. The world is one place in our one global village. Information is freely available. Countries are embracing reforms, and in Africa they are. You know, governance is improving. I mean, you can, selective uh, countries have done very well, but I think broadly you can see that reform is happening. You've got a growing consumer class who needs, uh, you know, need to be fed, need to be clothed, and what have you, to grow in. You've got a very young population that's, uh, quite a significant talent pool. We're having even what we call brain gain with people who have trained overseas coming back to the continent. We're seeing capital flows come into the continent, coming from, you know, uh, DFIs, we want to do good but bring money in. You've got, you know, diaspora remittances. I mean, take a country like Nigeria, all the estimates talk anything between 20 to 25 billion dollars worth of you see, commercial investors were not looking at Africa before beginning to take a look. People looking for yield. So there's, there's capital, there's talent, there's demand, there's business. So that's what's driving it. I think, you know, frankly, I, I keep saying the continent is still grossly underinvested. So the opportunities are still there. And, you know, alternative asset management is just another form of capital. Typically catalytic in a lot of cases, but still significant. So that growth, I don't see it stopping. If anything, it will keep accelerating. And just like it took, you know, 20 years to get from, you know, 1 billion to 30, I think the next round we're going to see it even accelerate further. And the early signs are that that's what's going to happen. Uh, let's talk about uh, some of the other things that will keep driving them. I think the African economies will continue to grow. Yes, the growth is not even all across the continent, but you said some of the highest growth countries are still in Africa. Ethiopia, Ghana, Botswana, still growing well. And even in Nigeria that, you know, just slipped into a recession a while back, it's coming out and it's growing at about 2%, needs to grow bigger, but, you know, it takes time for an elephant to grow. So uh, we're going to see, but, but it will continue to happen. Uh, significant gaps still exist across several enablers, but, you know, I still think inadequate financing is a big constraint, and that's why the opportunity is for alternative assets. You know, all forms of capital are required in, in, in Africa. You know, soft money, hard commercial money, and just and AUM is, uh, alternative assets is just a big class that should do well. And then uh, countries continue to do stuff that will open them up to, to uh, receiving that capital. And uh, we're beginning to see a lot of that happening. So with that uh, scene set, uh, let me talk about ACA. But even before I talk about ACA, you know, there's always the tendency to think that the returns of P in Africa have not been very good. Frankly, they've not been too bad. I mean, they started out well, if you look at the history of funds. Uh, the first set of funds did very well. I mean, ACA's first fund made a massive uh, return. And several people, you know, still, there was a slowdown and which impacted fundraising in the last couple of years. But that's because three of the big economies in Africa were challenged. You know, Nigeria went into a recession. Uh, South Africa, you know, stuttered. Egypt uh, had some challenges. And so that's why you had some of the very big uh, private equity firms who came in, KKR and the like, who pulled back when they couldn't, because these guys like to play skill. But, uh, you know, it's beginning to come back. We've seen last year there was a bit of uptick again in, in funds raised that slowed down between 2016 and 2017. And, you know, we're still seeing uh, a lot of uh, deal flow across uh, the continent. If you look at the kind of deals that you see, a lot of it are in the consumer space, because that, that consumer space will just keep growing. When you have that kind of population, people must eat, they must be clothed, they must move, 
and so the opportunities uh, uh, that, that just drives it. But you also begin to see multi-platform plays across the continent, you know, which tends to be the bigger size tickets. It's happening because, you know, as you look at, uh, you know, doing sub-regional plays, whether it's a downstream plays, people bought uh, Helios partnered with Vital to buy all the shell downstream assets across the, a good chunk of Africa, Vivo. We have other platform plays. We ourselves, we are in a, a, a continental insurance play that's pan, pan Africa. So we're beginning to see some of that too. Those tend to be the bigger ticket sizes, but the opportunities are there. Uh, ACA, just a look quick uh, recap of our history. We have, uh, we have uh, been investing. We have 1.2 billion in capital that we've uh, uh, raised. We've, uh, we have invested, uh, you know, have 28 plus invested companies. We now have an office in Accra. We have a Ghanaian partner who sits in that office. And his job is not just to get us deals in, 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 in Ghana, where we have invested. We have done some real estate deals before in Ghana. We, we just did a pension fund administration deal in uh, Accra recently. Uh, but also to help us open up the, uh, the, the Ivorian coast, which is next door to Ghana. So we're taking a look at trying to do that. Because I think the more, as you grow, you don't want to be stuck in only one, con one geography. And so when the headwinds come in that geography, you are, you are a bit stranded. It takes you time to trade out of some of those headwinds. So it's been a deliberate strategy to gradually try to increase our footprint, starting with West Africa, that's our main focus. So that's, that's, uh, that's uh, coming along very nicely. Uh, in terms of what we've uh, done and what makes us very powerful, uh, we have deep operating knowledge of our target markets, you know, just because we've been around long. We have extensive networks and relationships uh, across West Africa, but also you know, good networks into the rest of Africa which will build on increasingly as we try to expand. We, uh, we've gained from the experience of having investing. There's no better learning than having done it. So you take all your lessons learned, and some of those lessons we're, we're using now to make sure we don't uh, stumble again. You know, so things like you know, making sure you focus on early liquidity, very key. Uh, planning your exits uh, just even before you put any money to work, so you're thinking around that. Uh, I would say, you know, if you're going to do cash-hungry deals, try and deploy it quickly and focus on that IRR. That's the key, you know. I tell my young uh, investment officers who work for me to say, look, if you, it's very easy to say three times money back, you know, but three times money back in 12 years, there's it's nothing in an IRR world. But if you can get two times money back in five years, check, you probably have 25% IR. So focus on that IR. Early cash, uh, key operating levers, start driving them early. And I'll talk some more about how that is shaping how we invest. Uh, this is our sort of our history and the way we've grown our funds. We started with the first fund, uh, 35 million pound year. That fund generated like a 35% return, really outstanding, outstanding return. We got, and we're lucky. Uh, we got to we got into MTN at the ground floor, and you know what MTN did? You know, it just blew the market away. Uh, in 2005, we did a hundred million dollar fund. Uh, we've delivered 16 plus percent IRR on that one, and have uh, at least returned the capital substantially with some uplift. And then uh, in 2009, 2010, we did a third private equity fund. Before that, we did a real estate fund, by the way, 165 million. Uh, but just as that, as we raised that fund was the financial crisis. And so we decided to slow down deploying because it was just not the right time to start investing until the market recovered. Uh, and then 2010, back to the, uh, the 397 million that we uh, raised in our fund three, general private equity. That one we've returned all the capital, uh, but that's the one that actually really ran into headwinds because 
a lot of the, first, the investments we made when, you know, Nigeria commodity prices tanked, headwinds came, the country went into a recession, so we're struggling. But that's where the biggest lesson learned, because some of those are, if we had, you know, in, in, in hindsight, focused on that early exit, building them quickly, we could have gotten out before the, the, the volatility of uh, the swings uh, caught us uh, napping. But, but we're trading our way out of it, and hopefully now we're on the back of recovery, uh, we might uh, be able to still get substantial capital return and hopefully a little bit of uplift. And then the last one, which is the one we're investing now, we raised uh, 567 million in uh, closed in 2015. That we, we applied all the lessons we've learned. So even before we've closed the money, we had two deals ready to deploy. And, uh, and uh, so far so good, we have seven investing companies doing very well. We've uh, probably deployed at least uh, nearly two thirds and we, uh, we have a good pipeline to try and get uh, substantially deployed by next year. So, uh, we, uh, that's just a table showing our commitments and how. But the other thing that we've done too over the last few years is broaden our base of uh, LPs, of investors. So our first fund was mostly DFIs with some Nigerian money uh, and a couple of pension funds. But since then, we've brought in, and uh, today we have in, in investors from just about everywhere in the world. We have a European, we have pension funds from, from uh, South Africa, we have sovereign wealth funds of uh, Singapore and Malaysia who are invested in us. We have, uh, uh, you know, family offices, both from, you know, the US and in Nigeria. We, we have a couple endowments. Uh, we have, uh, you know, good, good commercial investors who are beginning to take a bigger bite and we hope to attract more of them. But the key is to, you know, make sure that you can show them value. And with that, it makes your fundraising a lot easier. So by the time we're getting ready to do a Cape 5, we want to be in a position where our track record will raise the funds for us. But so far, so good on, on, on Cape 4. It's uh, tracking well. We've also learned to diversify our portfolio so we don't have concentration risk. So our portfolio construction was done upfront, you know, with a clear diversity in mind in terms of not exceeding any sector, in any one sector with more than one quarter of the total funds. And so it's part of what you learn. But again, just pressing all those value levers. And I'll talk some more about what those value levers that help create uh, thing. This is just a pictorial setting of where all the investors come from. And you can see how it has gotten more global and hopefully we'll, we'll keep uh, deepening further. Now, talking specifically about our business, uh, we have uh, the Capital Alliance Private Equity Fund, which are main private equity investors, because our business is really three-pronged. So we've got private equity business, corporate PE. We've got a real estate business and we've got an asset management company. I mean, that's, so the biggest obviously is the private uh, equity platform, which, uh, and we've, we know, we've, we've, we've invested across all, you know, all the sectors, oil and gas, telecoms, media and technology, we've done FMCG and Agric, uh, focus, and we're looking at an, an Agric play now because not primary Agric, but more in the processing end. We haven't invested yet, but look, we have something that looks interesting. And then financial services, insurance, banking. I mean, that's, I mean, Union Bank, because we invested in Union Bank. So uh, uh, we brought, uh, when the bank had to be recapitalized uh, several years ago, we led a consortium of international organizations to take a controlling stake. And then, uh, yes, we're, we're looking at a couple of emerging sectors in Nigeria we are yet to do. We looked at health. We're going to do a healthcare one, but just time just ran out on us because it has a long gestation period. We're going to partner with people to build a hospital, but also tie down to a health insurance scheme. Looked like a good deal, but just time, because time is money in this business. It was taking too long to raise the debt financing that we needed to make it happen. So once we're not there by the 40 of the fund, I said, no, let's call it out. But we're still looking at anything that will be what I call upfront capital light, because that's my preference, 
I don't like to cash hungry deals. As you're sinking a lot of cash and you're waiting for your returns. To turn that thing around is, is, is always a struggle. So try and get in cash lights, structure for early cash, try and get, you know, instruments that allow you to get ongoing liquidity where possible. Helps you, helps your return. But, uh, and this is just a synopsis of some of the companies we've, uh, we've invested in, you know, across. Some very interesting ones, you know, Film House is a, is a cinema chain that uh, we invested in uh, in 2014. And they're rolling out cinemas, they have IMAX and all that. So it's one of those very contrary and plays that has played out very well. So they have the Film House, but they also have a content company and they have a film distribution company. So it's fairly multi-service, which is another thing that you learn as you do this investment. Don't invest in anything that has only one, is a one trick pony. Try and get several re streams of revenue. It always helps you to cushion uh, things. But uh, uh, we've done some manufacturing now with this Ford fund. Belox is a cracker uh, making company uh, that uh, has this very nice cracker that's doing very well. Uh, last year we invested also in a a personal care and home care company called Deraju, and they make a bouquet of uh, different products, you know, skin, you know, detergents and all that, but targeting the mass market. The mass market is where the juice is in Nigeria. I always say that if you had, you know, yesterday there were, you know, this number of people, a certain number of people using anything, tissue paper. Today, more people have added. Urbanization helps drive that. People who are living in the bush, they come to town, they have to use bathrooms, they have to walk, you know, it just, and that population just keeps growing. So, but you've got to get the right product at the right price point to target that market. So that's where all the things around capital efficiency and watching your costs and being able to, uh, you know, just squeeze value quickly is the key to successful investing. Uh, we have a real estate business. Uh, we, we invested in hotels targeting the major cities, hoping that at the time, you know, there will be enough, you know, dollar paying guests. That has not panned out like we expected. But we've, <laughs> we've uh, we started focusing on just driving value, managing our costs, uh, you know, trying to put conferencing facilities that we didn't have initially. And that's helping us. So. We're close to exiting one of those now because we've ramped it up sufficiently and hopefully we can get more exits. We've done commercial real estate, so we invested in malls. So the, again, targeted at a high-end market, we've learned our lessons there too. We've, uh, we, we did some residential, but at the right uh, price points. And, uh, and also, there's a residential we're doing now in uh, Lagos, but targeted is off-plan. So it'll be self-liquidating. And we've sold, I mean, we, it's phase one, we're gonna do like 103 units of the right kind of apartment. So it's one bedroom, plenty, two bedroom, and we're, it's selling. I mean, of the 103 units, we've already sold 50 plus and counting. So that, that's the kind of investment that makes sense. You know what I mean? That way you, you're, you're self-liquidating and you, you, know, you've, you've, you, you just you get your money back quickly. Uh, We've uh, thinking of doing a new real estate fund, but having learned the lessons of, of the past, we're going to now have uh, something that's more focused on the capital that's available, the big uh, pension funds and all that, people who look, who like yield. So we're going to make it an income fund that we can get assets that are already running and generating cash flow and you know, aggregate them into this fund. And, and at least so the people who invest uh, shove some yield and uh, you don't stop there. And in fact, when you develop that very well, you're going to have people developing stuff for you that meets your yield requirements. And so it just becomes, and that, you know, can grow. Early testing of that has received some very positive response and hopefully we're going to launch that uh, soon. Uh, we have a, an asset management business, still small relatively, but with a very good track record. We have a mutual fund listed in the Nigerian Stock Exchange that has done well, but we need to bulk it up. Uh, I, 
I think we're still saying too small. Given the network we have and the ability to grow that asset management, which is a good business if you have to do it well. And I think uh, we're gonna you know, uh, focus on it because there's nothing like yield. I mean, uh, one of the investments we made in uh, this Cape 4 in Ghana was a pension fund administrator. Just to tell you the power of, you know, uh, when we invested in that, in the, they had like $200 million under management. Today they are nearly eight hundred million dollars. You're getting fees on that on that bit, plus any upside you create in the income, uh, in investment income you keep too. So it's good business. It's uh, it just scales itself as you go along, and it's uh, good business. So it's kind of bring that same philosophy to what we're going to be doing in our asset management from bulk it up so that we have more multi products alliances that uh, can allow us deploy outside Nigeria where possible. Overall, performance, like I earlier alluded to, has not been too bad. If you look at it in, in, in aggregate with uh, return money, it's still big on realized portion to try and get back, but I think we're focused on trying to, to get a lot of those realizations now. They start out a little bit because of the macro that uh, threatened the world. But overall, not, not, not a bad record. I mean, in, in terms of IRO, well, on a gross up basis, it's still fairly decent. Could be better, and these are dollar-based. Uh, but we, we hope that we, with what we're doing now to focus on the things that can quickly help us drive IRO, we'll, we'll be getting those numbers on aggregate, we'll keep getting better. What are some of our key operating principles? These are the things that I really, I hold dear to my heart. To my heart. Be local, diversify across geographies, right? but have still the ability to be able to still sweat things locally. So, yeah, and, and one of the things we're looking to do more is to have alliances. I don't have to put my feet in the ground. So like on the real estate one, we're partnering with a big South African firm that has exposure to real estates in other markets. So from a JV, that way we get exposed to, you know, a Pan-African footprint without having to go and open offices there. So that way, you also helps your diversity in terms of, you know, a currency, because, you know, some of the countries have more stable currencies, so if you have exposure. Like, but yeah, we're going to build those partnerships to help. We're investing in, a, in an FMCG company, for instance, in fact, one of the investments we did with Beloxi, we partnered with a South Africa-based, uh, you know, uh, L, a, a GP. But even one we are looking at right now, we have a South African uh, GP interested in partnering with us 50-50. So we can bring them, you know, a nice exposure in Nigeria. They can get us something somewhere else. Net net, we're better off. So, uh, you know, we're. Uh, talked about just also diversity, diversifying our asset class, uh, you know, not having overt concentration in any one sector, make sure you have key things, but, you know, key spread, so your risk is better. Uh, but the, what, what I'd like to stress is how private equity has evolved and how we are adapting to it, which is Focus on how you create value. And for me, that's the key to successful investing in private equity. When you meet an investor, an, a potential investing company, you meet an entrepreneur, you want to support him. And all the guy needs is your money. He doesn't see any value that you are bringing to bear. He'll take your money. He'll sign anything you ask him to sign. But it's not like... You can collect if he doesn't meet your requirements. So showing him early, even as we are doing your due diligence, the value that you can bring, whether it's in terms of helping access markets, whether it's helping him with, you know, key, uh, you know, ways of improving his business, not just governance, which is the obvious, but you know, I, I say you're looking at a manufacturing company. Maybe the guy doesn't. He's not thinking good supply chain management. Maybe he doesn't know what it takes to have good distribution. So he ramps up his plant, you know, more production, but doesn't have the right distribution platform. 
So the more you can show them at the very beginning as you walk through the deal making process that you're bringing more than money. Uh, well, it helps to build alignment and it also helps to ensure successful outcomes. So you are truly partners. For me, it's key to say, um, I'm, a, I'm your partner of choice because I bring more than money. I bring, you know, networks. I bring access to markets. I bring operating processes that can help you improve your business. Because the statistics clear that the, the biggest lever in, in making companies do well, it's improving operating performance. You know, that's really good. And how do you do that? It's just the same good business processes, cost management, project management, you know, guys rolling out a new plant, you know, as they run it, for, as they show that it's going to get economics, cost and schedule, it's going to get the bills in time, because that's key. Any day delays, you're destroying economics. So it's just kind of, just kind of things. Commercial, you know, it's making products easy, is it pricing them right? And the ways in which you can improve is pricing uh, and, and being flexible and adapting as you go. If you put out a product that is no acceptance in the market, don't wait until it has bled you to debt. Cut it off. Find something else to make, you know what I mean? Build your, so just uh, simple things, but they help you to just, uh, uh, you know, keep, uh, but most importantly, identify those value levers. When I do diligence on a firm, I'm not just diligencing the financials, which I should do to check where the, where the net debt is so I can write down the value of my investment. That's good. So I can get it as a cost good price. But what else? Does he have the bandwidth of management? If it's a manufacturing company, does he have a good supply chain? You know, whatever. You know, does he have, uh, is he thinking backward integration? If it's manufacturing in Nigeria and he's still expecting, uh, you know, to keep all his inputs uh, foreign, uh, you know, once it takes his one currency upset and is dead. So having clear backward integration strategies that are well thought of, but can reduce that dependency. So those are some things you can do to help drive that cost management. You know, I'm not just talking project costs or capital capex, opex. It's very easy to build that cost and just managing that cost. It's, it's, it's key to delivering anything. I used to tell people, I said, you know, I have a simple model. Revenue less cost is what flows to the bottom line. So sometimes you get headwinds, revenue gets challenged. You can manage costs. At least you can control it. And, and so that's, those are some of the key things that I think are helping. Uh, I think, you know, Africa is, uh, you know, still a big opportunity uh, that is waiting to be tapped. I think uh, we in uh, ACA are very bullish about what we can do. We want to really grow and do more and, uh, you know, partner with people to try and improve our footprint so that we're not just seen as just a West African, Nigeria play, but at least having an increasing Pan-African uh, uh, footprint helps you. Helps you in fundraising, helps you mitigate your risks. So that's sort of what we think. So let me end up with uh, what I say is my ambition. Very, very, very ambitious. Very ambitious, but that's, that's, that's the, we'd say that's, so I'm, uh, I'm using this to try and motivate my folks to, about where we can get to. You know, I used to say, if you can dream it, you can get it. So we want to grow a UN. We want to be able to be, in the next 10 years, we want to be at 11 billion plus. It's not a, not, not a tall order, but I think if we do all the things, if we can execute, if we can build the partnerships I talked about, if we can do well, you know, I was looking at our real estate, I said, with this partnership we have with this South African firm, getting to the first billion dollars of assets that we manage might be tough. But I think once you get there, getting to five will not be too hard. There's just a velocity that comes as you do it. Same thing with our PE business, same thing with asset management. And uh, that's what I wanted to share. I'm happy to take any questions. I'm going to get into a session with uh, Ruti Mina, where he's going to ask me a few other questions. But uh, thank you all for listening. I thought uh, this is... I think, you know, you've, you've given a, a very 
informative technical introduction to, to the work that you're doing mm -hmm. um, across the continent, right? Um, starting out in Niger Nigeria, but uh, why don't we make it a little bit more personal okay. and uh, learn a little bit about who, who is Cyril Odu? What's, you know, what, what from your history, your childhood, your background brought you to, into this line of work and that you know, illustrious career? Yeah, thank you very much for that. I, uh, you know, I, I think I said at my introduction that I, I went to school, to, I went to University of Ibadan to read geology, and I read geology and uh, got a job in mobile as soon as I graduated. But you know, in the early days there were some compulsory courses they made us do in mobile. One was just called a uh, walk planning and appraisal workshop, just training you how to get set objectives and how you reach it. Sounds very basic, but it starts to put some discipline how you think about work. Mm -hmm. Very informative. Uh, but even before that, on one summer flight, I, was in, I, was, I went to the UK on vacation, and I had to, to make enough money to buy clothes to come back and look <laughs> tough. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I worked in an ice cream factory. Mm -hmm. and in an ice cream factory, you, know, you had to clock in. Time. If you were a minute late, you lost that hour, you know, that kind of. But you know, these two uh, Irish kids who were in the same factory with me, and I noticed that on Fridays, I was supposed to be half days, they worked extra. And I was, why? They said, because we need the money. You know what I mean? We were trying to go back <laughs> home. At home, we have to pay our bills. Mm -hmm. But what that taught me, and I saw the kind of people that worked there, was about the value of work, mm -hmm. the value of time management. Because mm -hmm. I, I recall I was living with an uncle very far away from where this factory was. Mm -hmm. I had to be at the bus stop at a particular time. Because yeah. I didn't want to be late. Because if I was late, I lost that one hour. You know what I mean? Yeah. So yeah. it just instilled some basic discipline in me yeah. about time, value, and, and all that. So those were, those were very so Fast track now to working in mobile in the early days and getting that exposure to, uh, you know, and it taught us economic evaluation. It sounded very, you know, I was a geologist, but it still taught us economic evaluation. Yeah. Just to understand. And, and that too left a, a mark on me. You know, it was, it was simple things, you know, buy vessels, lease, uh, you know, MPV. Yeah. <laughs> but, but it, so what that did was when I then had a chance on a cross posting to go to Houston, to work in Houston as a geologist, I decided to take an MBA part time. Mm -hmm. And I think, and I tell folks about the MBA, I think it's just something it does for you. It just kind of opens your mind, you know what I mean? Because you learn not just from, you know, what they teach you. You learn from your classmates. You learn about different perspectives. And in America, you actually learn about putting some of it to work. Because right? yeah, yeah. you're talking markets, you know. Yeah. Somebody's telling you, you know, the three Ps in marketing, you can feel it. You can yeah. see where they put things on the shelf when it works. You know, so just, and, you know, I had a professor of finance who left a mark. I mean, for me to be remembering what this guy taught me, you know, nearly 40 years ago, just shows you the kind of, in fact, it was about, first he said, you know, he was teaching us finance. He said, finance is accounting and economics intersecting. You know what I mean? It's not, uh, you know, he said, when he was growing up, there was no discipline called finance. finance yeah. But that guy taught us something about the 360 degree way to think about any investment. Mm. If you think the politics is not important, it is. Yeah. You know what I mean? If you think the work, and, and I, I was looking at, uh, one of the things it made us do was take a sector on track, you know, the stock prices. Yeah. And so I was looking at Mara, Mara, Mara Marita, the defense builder, and then McDonald Douglas. Mm -hmm. And at that time, the, McDonald Douglas does DC tents, and one of them had crashed. So, of course, that impacted the price. It's just like what's happening to Boeing now. Mm -hmm. But if anybody remembers 1979, Reagan was campaigning to become president. Mm -hmm. I know Reagan it was a defense hawk. Yeah. And so it was clear. But the bulk of McDonald's business is making defense, defense equipment. Yeah. So, of course, when, it was, when the price was tanking because of those two crashes, it was clear that once Reagan got into office, and started ramping up defense, mm -hmm. and the memory of that crash have kind of faded away, yeah. McDonnell Douglas will be up. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what happened, you know what I mean? Yeah. So, but, but it just kind of started you know, forming my impressions about you know, how to think about investing, mm -hmm. how to just bring everything, you know, like I said, take a 360 degree view of investing. Mm -hmm. It's not just uh, 
what the spreadsheet tells you. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I, you get some of my guys who calculate something for me. Oh, I say, yeah, yeah. The, the, the IR is like 17.3. Yeah. I said, come on, if I make four <laughs> change assumptions, yeah. I think it could be anything from 3% to, to 10 to 0. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. but it's just, you know, just thinking holistically right. about anything that can impact an investment. Yes, uh, uh, yes. So you, you joined um, Mobile 1971? 1972. 1972. Yes. And you know, over the course of, was it 40 or so odd yes. years, uh, or even years, um, you rose more or less to the top of that organization yes. um, in one of the most powerful organizations or companies in the world. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what, what was the secret in, in that journey that they kept pushing you in particular and not the next person to, to just keep you know, pushing to the top of the organization? You know, a couple of things I, I can talk about. So when I went to Houston as a geologist, mm -hmm. I was sitting in a mobile office and I was the only black geologist. Yeah. And I remember going to collect logs, you know, that I needed for my work. Yeah. From the lady in, in charge of the log room was a black lady. Mm -hmm. And she was like, uh, did you come to collect it for somebody? I said, no, for myself. <laughs> and she goes, are you a geologist? I said, yes, I am. Yeah. Because she was just completely. Yeah. But what that taught me was that I had to be very competitive. Mm. I don't know if you know what I mean, but you know, because right. given that if I had to compete in a global company like mobile, right. I had to try to be the very best. So that started forming some basic philosophies that have helped me, and I pass it on to my folks. Mm. You know, people who come to me in, when I was in mobile and even in AC, I work, say, I won't be promoted. I say, you know, if you're focusing on the promotion, just any job in front of you, just mm. give it your best. your best. First of all, doing a good job is very, very self-fulfilling. You know what I mean? If you do a good piece of work, you're happy. I don't know what I mean. yeah, yeah. And sometimes you have a boss who might not even appreciate it or even takes, steals your thunder. Mm -hmm. Don't let it upset you. <laughs> <laughs> a day will come when they will find out that you're the one doing the work. Yeah. And even though he might not appreciate your work for any kind of reason, mm -hmm. somebody else is. Mm -hmm. And so what happens with that is that you get jobs that you didn't apply for. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you understand, you know what I mean? Yeah. Somebody sees you working very well, he sees the product you put out. And I say, you know, so you come work for me. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And that's, and, and, and that's how you just, can, you know, and so just focusing on what is at hand, trying to give it your best shot, yeah. and just uh, keep, keep doing it. And, I, you know, the jobs will come. Mm -hmm. The jobs will come. I mean, yeah. that's, that's the lesson of my life, and I, and I take it very seriously, and I give that same advice to folks. Okay. Just, so uh, now you all know the... The secret is, is, is doing the best with what, what's in, in, in front yeah, of put, you. Yeah, put, put that work in front of you, just give it to give you the best. You know? Okay. And, 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 so, and think of yourself as competing. I mean, I used to, if I was going to hire anybody in mobile, I mean, like I said, I ran a child. I used to say, you know, you're going to join us in Nigeria, but you're going to be competing in a global company. company yeah. So you've got to be world class. You know what I mean? Don't compare yourself with the geologist working in there. Yeah, yeah. You compare yourself with the best. And then do you, do you enjoy competition? Do you thrive on competition? Are you a naturally competitive uh, person? Not in a negative way, but, you know, but in a positive, <laughs> yeah. reinforcing way to help you do well. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yes. And, that, uh, and that's why I focus. Focus on what you do and do it well, rather than yeah. worry about you know, yeah. what the other guy is there doing. Because yeah. you're not, and, and frankly, you know, fr it is, no matter how good you are in anything, one yeah. man cannot make it all happen. Yeah. So teamwork, you know what I mean? Yeah. And for me, the most important ingredient is emotional intelligence. Mm. It's so key for mm. success in the workplace. In fact, anywhere. You know, just being able to read people and read situations right. and know how to adapt. You know, but is that, is that something that um, you, you picked up naturally, maybe from your family dynamics or your own personal, or is that something that you had like a mentor um, that you identified and you emulated the way they managed political stage because these types of companies, Siemens, Exxon, it's very political. And to rise through all of that uh, to, to get to the top, you, obviously you must demonstrate. Yeah, I know, but, but you, you learn from, so I worked for quite a few bosses, in, uh, particularly when I was in uh, planning, which was like the investment right. advisory part of the mobile. So I ran from, I worked for like, somebody who was very dictatorial, you know what I mean? I mean mm -hmm. You walked into his room, anything could f get him your temper. <laughs> and you learn that you have to know how to manage your boss. You, know, mm -hmm. you start understanding what he doesn't like to see and what he, he likes to see. Mm -hmm. You flip around and the next boss is a different person. He gives you all the leeway, mm -hmm. but yet he's very focused on the results. So understanding people, you know, 
one of the things that I learned very early in life from a course I actually went to was it's very easy where you're having challenges with somebody to blame that person. Right. But you can't actually change that person. Mm. So think about what you can do to improve the situation. Mm. Even, even in family life, you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, you can't, you know, you can have a difficult child. You know what I mean? And you say, okay, this child doesn't know what to do. But okay, what are you going to do? Are you going to kill the child? <laughs> you can't kill the child. So how do you, <laughs> so how do you learn to manage it? You know what I mean? It's yeah. very, it's a bit, and so once you, you're, you're that sensitive that, you know, you need to work on yourself mm -hmm. rather than think you can change the change. other person. It helps right. you. Uh, Innovate. Yes. Yeah. And I think that that's, it helps you build that a motive, you know, that, that right. it helps you manage right. people, manage situations. And all right. that. Yes. So just, just hitting a nail on this topic of, uh, you know, pushing through difficult situations, mm -hmm. um, political situations, so on and so forth. Um, you've seen all, a, a whole bunch of chaos that has happened in Nigeria's economy since you joined um, um, uh, Exxon. And I, I guess you managed the company through the devaluation of the, the Naira, mm -hmm. um, which must have been very tough, even though you're in the oil, the oil and gas uh, space. Mm -hmm. How did you innovate your way through that or keep things afloat during that period of time? Was it difficult? Was it easy? Or did you have to really come up with new methodologies? It wasn't easy, but one of the things I learned working for mobile and I applied was how to negotiate. And I said, if you, if, you, if you have to deal with the Nigerian government mm -hmm. on a regular basis, when, you know, because they are partners in, mm -hmm. in the oil industry, as you know, mm -hmm. if you can't negotiate, you'll be dead. Yeah. I mean, this, so having such difficult partners and being able to carry them along. And you know, I, I, I learned to do some things that were very uh, counterintuitive, you know. I, I, re I believe in open book economics. Mm -hmm. So if myself and NNPC are going into a deal, mm -hmm. I show them their economics. Mm -hmm. I don't forget that because they don't think yeah. about it those times. They think, yeah. they think if you're making money, means that they are losing money. Right, right. <laughs> but, right. Uh, yeah. but just getting them along, you know, so carry them along. I, you know, I'll do finances in which I'll go sit with the Minister of Finance where they then said, you know, this thing is good for Nigeria. Mm -hmm. Let me show you why. This is what the government will make. Yes. Not, not, yeah, we'll do well. Yeah. And for me to do well, I need this kind of incentives. But to see what your own pie is going to look like. Yeah. And I think that, that, and so we did some earth breaking, I mean, in all modesty, financing, just being able to carry an MPC along yeah. and being able to walk through the emotions, they can get very emotional. Mm -hmm. But you know, data and analytics don't lie. Yep. And so just cut out the emotions, let's get back to <laughs> yeah, well. yeah. Yes. I could look anybody in the eye and I did a few times and said, I have to have a 25% return on this deal. Yeah. Yeah, with a straight face. And the guy said, well, I said, well, the reason is simple. If I made this investment in the North Sea and I got 18%, mm -hmm. I can take that 18% to the bank. Yeah. In Nigeria, devaluation can come. Mm -hmm. They can tighten the pots. They can impose a new tax. Any, whatever, that, yes. anything, yeah. So I need to be 25%. And if, and I'll, you know, so, because I need to have that cushion. Mm -hmm. because, and, and I'll show you how I, how I get it. I'll show you my cash flow. Let's solve for, for yeah. let's solve for how I get 25%, yeah. you know. And, uh, but in a traditional negotiation, if you take an open book policy and you show, especially a government uh, entity, the, the amount of cash flow, your, your business model, and you're, you're putting all your cards I on the table. I show them their cash. Their yeah. cash flow, right. Their cash flow, because they, they'll make more money than yourself. I mean, in the oil industry, as you know, in Nigeria, yeah. tax rates is 5%, okay. gradually 20%. They get all the money. Yeah, yeah I get a little sliver. But do they enough. try to go beyond their cash flow and try to get to, to, to yours? But that's why you, 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 you deal with it by being open. I don't get it. Gotcha. Show them, show them the economics and they, they, they will see it. And, and frankly, it worked, I can tell you. Mm -hmm. so, several times we had to, to go through this. I'll, I'll give you another example. So, you know, we used to do Naira accounting in the oil mm -hmm. industry. And you know, the, the oil business is a dollar business, as you know. And so because we lift oil and then we have to pay the taxes 60 days later, when Nigeria was rapidly devaluing, mm -hmm. it meant that at the time we were settling the tax bill, we needed fewer dollars yeah. you know, because the Naira yeah. had computed yeah. <laughs> the yeah. thing based on Naira. And so I went to see the tax authorities because well, it was creating issues for me, generating all this exchange gains and mm -hmm. losses depending on where the thing was mm -hmm. swinging. That was not good. But for the government, they were getting less revenue. 
So, uh, and I, you know, I, I, I thought everybody thought dollar counting made sense yeah. for a business that's purely dollars. So when we see the chief, the head of tax, myself and my MD, to tell him that, and I showed him the impact of what yeah. you know, Naira counting was doing to me. Yeah. He looked at the numbers and he saw that I was right. Then he looked at me and he said, but why are you trying to, why are you trying to help me? Yeah, help, help, yeah. help me help you. <laughs> you know, what is the need for you? I said yeah. nothing, it's just that it's the nuisance of having to do this. <laughs> you know, generating this paper you know, losses or paper gains that don't translate to anything. And for you it's better because it just saves me work. Mm. And that's how we got dollar accounting. I mean, mm. the industry had been pushing for it, mm -hmm. but it made everybody's life easier and the government benefited yeah. from it. And that so, made you know, life easier for other people people that came behind yes, in the industry yes. and it's leveraged uh, in the infrastructure space. Yes, I do it even in, 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 in P that I'm investing in now. So, yeah. you, know, uh, you know, we're talking to this guy who did, uh, who did a biscuit company and it's like you, P people just want to get your return. And I said, yeah. okay, let's take it easy. You own 60% of this company, we own 40%. Right. This company does well. At the time we invested, it was what, $150 million. Mm -hmm. If it becomes a $300 million mm -hmm. business, mm -hmm. Who is smiling to the bank now? Right. Yourself, yeah. right? Yeah. Now think about it. If somebody comes and buys my 40% stake mm -hmm. and gives you a check for 11% of that, Bigger. Yeah. you get a check. Yeah. And if it is Cadbury or if it is Kellogg and all they need is 51% and control, mm -hmm. the business will flourish. Yeah. You can retire and just be waiting for your dividend checks yeah. forever. And you'd be like, sure. mm. When I told him that there was a light bulb moment, I don't know if you know what I mean, yeah. said, that I wasn't just pushing to create value quickly right. because I was greedy PE trying to squeeze through, squeeze through. But I was going to help him build a business that he would be, you know, you know well off from. Well, big time. Yeah. But that, that, not, not everybody's that way, don't get me wrong. It's, it's a lot of work, what I'm saying. I'm keeping it very simple. But, yes. but, but if you go with that mindset that it's, 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 uh, I mean, that's why you see that vision that I put up about yeah. building a life-changing wealth mm -hmm. for all stakeholders. Yep. It includes investing companies, it yep. includes LPs who give us money, it includes yeah. our staff. Yeah. I want them to be wealthy. Yeah. How can they be wealthy? If we quickly get to carry the interest mm -hmm. on, on any fund that we are investing. Mm -hmm. I mean, people start seeing that those points that they get, those carry points, mm -hmm can make them millionaires. Wealthy, yeah. I think it can change how they work. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because yeah. everybody has the same goal. Plus, it will carry everybody along because remember, the, you know, we have to get to a huddle rate yeah. on a total portfolio basis. Yeah. So because I built a fund model that I used to track it, if they were sitting at the end of the year and we're just at 1.5, we know we need to get to total 1.4x, we need to get to 1.6x. And it's one particular portfolio company dragging us down because mm -hmm. they're not doing well. What do you think will happen to everybody? Mm -hmm. They will go push and say, what can we do to help you? <laughs> you know, yeah. we gotta, we gotta, we're yeah. going to move this ship. Forward. And, and that, that uh, so it's alignment, you know what I mean? It's, yeah. it's very key. The more you can get aligned with the people you're working with, yeah. it's, it's, uh, it's in, so, not easy, but you know. It's, so, so if we now go very deep into one of the, the industries that you know more than, more than anyone else, because we're talking to this audience, I, I presume they don't know that much about the Nigerian oil um, and gas sector, but uh, maybe they do know that it's one of the, it's the, is it the fifth largest oil producing, or is it oil uh, yeah, yeah, well, nation six, in the world, and, 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 and gas as well. From yeah, gas is not producing as much gas, but we have the reserves. We have the reserves, right? Mm -hmm. um, but yet still in 2019, it is that we're importing you know, the bulk of the product that we're used, utilizing for 180 million people. Uh, how does that make you feel? Uh, you, know, from, you know, from after being in the industry for so long, um, anything that you wish could have been done differently to change that situation? Because we're dependent on, it, yes. on the world markets, even though we have the resources. I think it's reforms. And it's, it's just an acceptance that we need to reform if the Saudis can reform. I mean, maybe not completely, but at least they're, yeah. <laughs> they're doing it. They've yeah. increased fuel prices in a lot. Right, right. They've, they've reduced subsidies. And yeah. it's, uh, so it's, uh, I mean, what we're doing is actually foolhardy. Mm -hmm. You know, rather than focus on baking a, big, a bigger pie. Mm -hmm. In fact, the right thing to do is to reduce taxes mm -hmm. in the oil industry. And to free it up from government control. Government so you control, get, okay. Yes. 
Um, I mean, there's nothing wrong with regulation, you know what I mean? Sure. But regulation is not the same thing as stifling businesses. businesses you know? yes. And government being in business is bad business. <laughs> and so you've got NNPC who is in, you know, joint venture with everybody. That's the National Petroleum Oil National Petroleum Oil Company, company. yes. So uh, and I hope we get, but I'm hoping that, I mean, actually, I mean, uh, I've been giving sort of advice from the background. Uh, and one of the things that the Minister of uh, Budget and National Planning mm -hmm. said, we'll see whether that will happen, yeah. about trying to uh, sell down the stakes in the JV. Mm -hmm. If it happens, the joint ventures that they have with oil companies, mm -hmm. if they do implement it, they will generate a lot of cash. Yeah. Uh, they don't have to finance the oil industry as they're yeah. doing now. Yeah. How can they be financing something that can finance itself? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? The returns are good. Leave the, they can, mm -hmm. raise, if they're in control, they can raise money mm -hmm. and, and pay their bills. Mm -hmm. And then you just sit and collect your taxes and royalty. Yeah. So, uh, so it's a shame that we're still there. Same thing with gas. That's part of why gas is still not willing buyer, willing supplier. Right. Uh, we're still not quite there. Yeah. So, uh, you're seeing deals where you can have maybe a private owner of gas selling to a private consumer and the structure of their deal and it's commercially good. Mm -hmm. Everybody's happy. The guy can take the gas and make money from what he produces, yeah. maybe feedstock for yeah. fertilizer or whatever. But that's, so we still have a long way to go there, yeah. unfortunately. But, uh, and I think it's impacting the economy because yeah. unfortunately, uh, I mean, that's our biggest resource, but we yeah. could use it to, you know, Propel the economy. To you know, drive other sectors of the economy mm -hmm. would have been great. So yeah. the, the uh, theme for this conference is disrupt um, yeah. and, 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 and how to do so. Mm -hmm. you, as you look at the, the audience here, um, you know, what pieces of the sector, um, and also if you look at the geography of, 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 that, you know, of Africa, which is different people across di different geographies, um, where do you see the biggest opportunities for disruption? And what markets excite you the most? Uh, you know, would you advise someone to start in Nigeria or go to markets where perhaps it's easier to get started before eventually working your way to? to no, I, like I, think, I think you can start in just about any country, you know what I mean, yeah. to be honest with you, is to find the, I mean, take like the lack of infrastructure has turned to an opportunity, if you know what I mean. Yeah. So, Yep. Of it's logistics, you know I mean? yeah, logistics, uh, sure. supply chain management, you know what yeah. I mean, uh, off-grid power, like, yes. uh, I think you're interested, you know what I mean, so, uh, because if you're waiting for government, government to change, <laughs> it's, not gonna <laughs> it's gonna be, and I like the fact that people are disrupting, if you look at the things that, you know, whether it's Jumai, even Jumai, if they're struggling, yeah. or it's a flutter wave, or it's Max, Max, um, yes, people are, people are doing stuff, yeah. and, and I think, uh, and that's where, you know, talent, and yes. I think uh, particularly, you know, people who have, you know, got the benefit of schooling outside, I've seen other things at work. Mm -hmm. find, uh, find your niche mm -hmm. and execute, mm -hmm. and try and keep away from anything that has too much government yeah. Uh, involvement. Yeah. And just try and leapfrog, you know what I mean, yeah. some of the uh, bottlenecks that inhibit, and I, I can see a lot of, Nigerian kids doing doing that, and it's uh, every day I see something else that. Whereas well, the guys who we're talking about who are renting up, finding empty houses and finding tenants to yeah. match landlords instead yeah. of keeping their apartments yeah. empty, that's that's a disruption. So there are problems. So let, yes. let me put it this way, and, yes. and no offense in this, the no, no, previous no. generation has left um, a lot of gaps um, in 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 these countries, Correct. which you are seeing young technology companies or finance, you know, fintech companies, tech-driven entities mm -hmm. that are now coming in and tackling it in a decentralized right. manner. Um, and those things obviously take time before they even become relevant for private equity true, investors. True. But you're spending time advising these you know, young people to, mm -hmm. to tackle these problems? I am. And one of the things that, uh, I mean, I, I mean, not time to do it, ACHI, a company that has uh, you know, young tech people. Yeah. And, and one of the things I've been, you know, preaching to them is to don't depend on government business as much as possible. Yeah. You know, you have big data, try and sell your analytics to private businesses. They need it. They need it. Yes. And they're selling their analytics, for instance, to Ecodisco. Yeah. And helping them with, you know, smart metering and stuff, yeah. you know what I mean? And just risk. But that's, that's what uh, you can do. I, uh, 
I think there's a bit of a flavor of the month in technology, particularly in fintech. Mm. And so a lot of these guys come to me and they're talking like that. But as, as I come down, I don't want the weeby stuff. Tell me how they think I make me money yeah. or can help me <laughs> save costs. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so it's not just technology for technology's sake. Yeah. You know, help me solve something, help me focus on something that can that can work for me. Sure. And sure. I think when people take a step back like that, yeah. and not just thinking about Series A and Series, series B. Series B, yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. I've seen that, you know what I mean? No, I, that was mentioned on one of the yes. panels earlier. Yeah, I've seen, yeah. you know, guys come and I have a couple of friends who will seek them. And then the guys go and they're, 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 they're just moment you give them, moment you give them money, they're, they're doing the next fundraise. <laughs> <laughs> and then when they go to the same, you know, this evaluation now, you must go. Right. Some have come to me and I'm, I can't pay this kind of money for this. He said, but that's what the last one is. <laughs> so you go and find <laughs> which yeah, you can. Sure. yeah, so, but I, but I think the opportunity are there and I think the young people, it's a shame about that. You know, and even Nigeria with all its difficulties, yep. people are finding a way to, to break it. Some of the economies have been more open Mm. So you can find places like Rwanda and Kenya, you know, are doing stuff. Ghana, you know, and, yes, and, yes, and uh, yeah. but Nigeria, because it's the biggest, has can't ignore it. Can't ignore it, but also has the biggest opportunities. You know, sure. I mean? and the scale when you crack it in Nigeria, you make it big. Yes, I always still used to tell my colleagues in mobile that yeah, this place can wear you out too. Yeah, but you can get good returns. <laughs> you get <laughs> but you got to have perseverance. You have to have resilience. Patience. Okay. Yeah, there's a book uh, Leke Acha and uh, a couple of his colleagues just published, okay. Okay. Business Revolution in Africa. In Africa. How to succeed in the new market. I recommend folks to read it. Okay. It's a good book. Uh, they interviewed a lot of people. They came up with some of the things that you need to be able to succeed in Nigeria, in Africa. No. You know, resilience, you know? Uh, Grit. Yes, yeah. Grit. Talent that's there, but you need to groom it, you know what I mean? So yeah. having to train people. Yeah. Understanding markets. Because mm -hmm. not all the markets in Nigeria are the same. Mm -hmm. yeah, as an example, I'm talking about Nigeria. Yeah. You know, I tell my, my uh, banker first, I say, well, you know, do you, do you know what demographics have changed? Mm -hmm. Have you tapped into that? Yeah. Everybody's marketing people in Lagos. Outer Abuja has grown with more people mm -hmm. because Boko Haram has driven people down yeah. to settle in Abuja. Those communities that have created outside Abuja, mm -hmm. they need housing, they yes. need, you know, whatever. Yeah. That's opportunity. Yeah. So, but, but you've got to understand that, you know, right. the market for beer in Porta, you know, Nietzsche is not the same as the market, market for, for beer. Mm -hmm. And how do you find a product that fits that market mm -hmm. at the right price point yeah. and you'll be good soon? Let's talk about women in in business. Um, yeah. uh, we've heard some from from some um, you know some brilliant women speaking today on some of the, the panels as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and given the the tenor of your of your career, is it becoming more equitable in places such as not just Nigeria across the the continent? When you go and you do these deals and you're looking at the people running these companies that you invest in, are you uh, uh, well, one, ensuring that you look for diversity in the kinds of organizations. And are we starting to make it more feasible for women to take the home in, in Africa? We are. I think we still have a long way to go. But I mean, I personally am uh, very, very committed to gender diversity. I can, I can understand my bias. I have only daughters. I have four. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> so I'm biased in that, in that particular yes. respect. But seriously speaking, it's something that it's clear to me yet. Uh, so in Union Bank, for instance, a deliberate attempt to try and balance the workforce. Yeah. And uh, I think at the time we joined, I mean, two things we did. One, the median age when we joined the bank was 50 something. You know, Union Bank was old. Yeah. 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 Yes, in fact, uh, the, you know, the slogan for Union Bank was strong, <laughs> but yeah. reliable. Yeah. At the time we got it, it was not that strong. Or it was not strong as but, with but, the, but the workforce was just totally out of date. Yeah. So we've changed them around. We reduced that median age to 34. Mm -hmm. We've increased the women proportion mm -hmm. to, uh, it's about 40, 60 now. Okay. But still, I mean, targeted right. to grow. I still don't see enough in the leadership, mm -hmm. and I'm pushing for that. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what types of things? What types of things are you doing practically to push for that? Because you're, you know, uh, you're one person. Well, yeah, uh, yes, no, but but for the organizations that one is involved in, yeah. I would I'd push it. You know okay. what I mean? Uh, so, I mean, I had two board positions on the Union Bank that were available two years ago. Yeah, deliberately women. I didn't, I didn't go out for any. Mm -hmm. Deliberately, just to balance it. Yeah. Still not even as balanced as I like it to be. To be yeah. And we found talented women, so it's not like uh, right. Yes, so uh, 
I think generally, though, in Nigeria, I don't think there's, at least most of corporate Nigeria, particularly in the financial services, the women running insurance companies, the women running mm -hmm. banks, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think there's been no, I don't think there's that kind of glass ceiling yeah. for women in Nigeria. Uh, uh, is that a cross board? I would say no. not enough. Mm -hmm. uh, women, business, I mean, we, we're getting a facility from OPIC. Yeah. And one of the things that uh, they wanted to see was our program for women in business. Mm. And so we're, we're targeting that group. For, for one thing, they're probably safer bets anyway, mm -hmm. in terms of who you lend money to. True, yeah. yeah so, uh, so. And as you invest in FMCG uh, companies and in retail businesses and so on, you, you find as well that you know, women are driving a lot of those purchasing decisions as yes, well. Yes, yes. Um, so it's, it's clearly important to make sure that. Even in product. Like in, in banking, with the problem, the products we developed. In fact, there's a product in Union Bank we'll called Stella. It was a profile of a particular I mean, lady you know, yeah. who we found was because the housewife in Kaduna doesn't have exactly the same profile as the housewife in yeah. in uh, Lagos. Right. So how do you how do you reach that? Right. Yes, right. knowing what their profile, what are the products you should be selling to them? Right. They're very good savers. Again, they're good, you know. Yeah. Customers they to run, target. They run, they run. Yes. And you, as you start focusing on diversity, you'll be surprised what you learn. Yeah, you the the Northern woman on the board of Union Bank was the one telling me that in the old city of Kano, most of the retail businesses you see are owned by the women in Poda. Mm. They're in Poda, mm -hmm. covering themselves. They don't even come out, but they have a network of people selling for them. Mm. So, and if you, of course, if you leave them out and you don't appeal to them, then you're missing it. So you have to find a way to reach them. Right. Let's uh, just very quickly, because I know we're, we're eating into time here, okay, but sorry, yeah. um, if we, talk, we think about, there was recently, um, the, you're familiar with the business Andela? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, 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 the tech company that helps uh, staffs people on global consulting mm -hmm. work for, for tech. Um, Al Gore invested, I think it was something like $100 million. Mm -hmm. So we can imagine the valuation of that company today. Um, the story of it, it was started by both uh, an, an American guy, Jeremy, and uh, Ying, the Nigerian founder. And in the recent Bloomberg News articles, there was all this um, uh, um, controversy around, is it an African, can you really call it an African startup? Are you finding this issue as well where um, you know, most of the, the best African startups are actually not uh, being started uh, or being led to the end or at least through the development by Africans? Is that something that bothers you? Or are you just saying, look, I don't care whether you're African or you're not African. If you've got a great idea and we've got problems, come and let's collaborate. And does it matter whether it's, it's led by an African person? No, that shouldn't bother us. In fact, part of my disappointment, it's, generally speaking, is that some areas that I don't know why we why Nigerians, for instance, have not done better. Mm. Take light manufacturing. Sure. You know, people think about the Chinese and, and you know, today in Nigeria, they're Chinese with small factories, yeah. just doing stuff, yeah. you know, which you know, frankly not rocket science, sure. but you need resilience, you need people that, you know, mm -hmm. you know that, you know, I, I used to have some Nigerian friends, they start a business, and the guy said, I'm an industrialist, you know, mm -hmm. and he starts <laughs> carrying on like he's a big shot, you know, yeah. but rather than, you know, build a business, you know, with tenacity, and so that's staying power, you know, just not just, you know, make a quick hit and want to move on, yeah. is what I like to see more. That's not the system Nigerians are not doing a lot of businesses. Yes. I've invested in a Nigerian run, and, and they're doing well. Yeah. and they take advice and they build, but I like to see more. Yeah. And, and, I, I, and I take the point that why can't some of us look at those opportunities mm. and take advantage of that? Why does it take a foreigner to see where these opportunities are and gra right. grab them from right. where? Right. You know, light manufacturing, for instance, in Nigeria, has always been a lot of foreigners, of all kinds, you know, Indians, Lebanese. Lebanese. I'm looking at a cosmetic company now, yep. produces cosmetic, not, they're not competing with Gucci's for the the, the, you know, the, the low end basically. people, but they, but they have a strong market. Lebanese guys, been in Nigeria for years. Hmm. And they have a factory in Ivory Coast, they have in Lagos. Torama. Produce, produce in, very efficiently. Yeah. Torama with Indomie came to Nigeria in 1996. Look at right. where they are. You know, right. so, uh, so that's why it's kind of good to see what Dangote is doing. But we need more. We need more yeah. of those kind of people uh, okay. to make things. Because the manufacturing in Africa still has a long way to go. 
Mm. We should be making all our goods in Nigeria. Mm. I mean, that Archer's book talks a lot about that. And that, you know, we need to start making more things in Nigeria. In Nigeria. Yes, uh, no, no, in Africa generally, yeah. just to ramp up manufacturing. There's, there's a lot of manufacturing, but mm -hmm. more, I mean, there probably more manufacturing in Lagos 30 years ago than there is today. Than there is today. Which is really sad. Wow. But they need to re, re, re sculpt those businesses, not to be too dependent on foreign uh, imports, but to look at local sourcing and efficiency. Mm -hmm. and, and, and some of it is to think about how to do business. I was talking with a Lebanese family that used to sell Vespas, Bolos, Rabbi Vespas, yeah. And today they make tissue. So there was people driving Vespas like the, you know, <laughs> around the Lagos or different? Today they make tissue. And when the guy was telling me some of the things they've done, Efficient. Even in the machines they bring in, they try and bring robust machines. They don't bring ones with too many sensors that yeah. each time nap, you know, the light flicks, yeah. the thing will break down. Yeah. So it's that kind of thing, something more robust that can adapt itself to that environment. Right. You know, recruiting the right people, training them, mm -hmm. and just investing in them. Mm -hmm. and because, yes, it will be difficult. You're going to get the pots strangle you in terms of, but the margins might not be small, mm -hmm. but the, the volumes are big. Big. So yeah. from their tissue, they said they tried to do it in other West African countries, but they were too small. Even mm -hmm. though the margins are good, but wouldn't you rather be selling, you know, two million, two million tissue yeah. a day, and even if it's ten percent okay. net margin, you're still better off. You're still better off than, yeah. you know. Makes sense. Yes, half a million. So yeah, I, I, I share that. I'm not, but I'm not demoralized. I think the more, you know, we we Nigerians and Africans generally take advantage of the opportunities that are staring us in the face mm -hmm. uh, and, and yeah. be ready to, to do it for the long haul. Yeah. It's never easy. Yeah. Yeah. And that resilience and patience to build it yeah. uh, is always uh, it's needed. Is, is needed.